Um, today we're pleased to have uh, David Wild from Indiana University uh, presenting on large-scale cross data set mining of chemical and biological data sets for drug discovery. Um, David is associate professor at, at uh, Indiana University, the School of Informatics and Computing, and he directs the Cheminformatics and Chemogenomics Research Group. Um, he's uh, uh, has a research program, does educational, uh, has an educational focus as well, and uh, working on a long distance, uh, a distance education program uh, started before the time of MOOCs, and you can find additional information about him at that URL below. So I'll now uh, switch uh, presentation mode to David, and uh, he'll take over and start his presentation. Thank you to Tony. Dave, for uh, letting me, me give this, this webinar. Uh, after I think I've been a professor now about eight or nine years, and uh, we learned to really enjoy being able to talk a lot. I always say to my students, <coughs> we're very good at opening our mouths and letting things come out, but not very good at stopping. So uh, do feel free to post any questions. I will be able to monitor the the chat box, so I will try to address those, and uh, you know, hopefully we can have a little bit of interaction as well uh, towards the end, as well as me just talking. Uh, so as uh, Dave said, I uh, uh, work in the. <coughs> okay, uh, here I'm a little quiet, so maybe this is better. I'll just get a little closer to the microphone here. Is that better? Okay. Great. So I'm in the School of Informatics and Computing here at uh, Indiana University. Um, <clears throat> I was actually uh, recruited by Gary Wiggins, who many of you probably know, um, to start a cheminformatics program here back in the um, early 2000s. And before that, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and before that, I uh, did a PhD and postdoc in cheminformatics from. Uh, the Sheffield Group in the UK. So I've kind of taken a little journey from academia through industry. I uh, was a consultant for a while back to academia, uh, but uh, this is where I am now. So the um, so I run the Cheminformatics and Chemogenomics Research Group um, here at um, Indiana. I'm here. Research side. Uh, when I was in industry in the 1990s late 1990s is when lots of machines were coming around that started spurting out lots of data. Um, so I suppose it was the start of the big data era and uh, at the time it was high throughput screening machines and microarray assays. So a lot of my work in industry was saying, you know, do, how can we do something useful with all this data spurting out of various places? So this got me interested in um, large-scale data set analysis, which um, led to the research topic that I'll be talking about uh, today. But I did just brief, want to briefly say a little bit about our education programs here at Indiana uh, before we talk about the research. Um, we actually started off um, launching programs in uh, 2000, well, actually 2001, Gary Wiggins started it going and I kind of took it over. Um, but um, you know, it was based on the observation of very few sites in the world offering formal degrees in cheminformatics. Um, so we launched the MS in cheminformatics and then PhD in cheminformatics in 2005. Um, we've had actually nearer to 50 now students uh, graduate from those courses um, or current students in those courses. Uh, particularly, we're kind of emphasizing the PhD program now. And uh, we've been very lucky to have a a uh, really great set of students come come through the program, um, but right from the start we realised that you know there are very few academic sites doing cheminformatics, and not everybody who wanted to learn about cheminformatics was going to come to a you know albeit pretty uh, small midwestern town in Indiana to learn about it. So we put a lot of emphasis on enabling people to learn about cheminformatics remotely. And I'll just be saying a little bit about that. As David said, pretty much anything I talk about today will be some kind of reference on 
uh, djwild.info um, if you want to learn a bit more. Um, so on the educational side, we offer a residential PhD program, but also we have a set of options that people can do remotely. We have something called a graduate certificate in chemical informatics, which can be um, involves four courses that can be taken entirely remotely. And uh, we found this has been really, um, work, really worked well, particularly for people in industry or in other academic disciplines at other universities that want to learn the, the basics of cheminformatics and get some kind of quali quali university qualification for it. Um, we've also been trying to push out as much as we can just for people to informally learn about cheminformatics. And uh, we've set up a site called ISEC, the Indiana Cheminformatics Education Portal. And we're really trying to <clears throat> populate that with as much free um, uh, learning resources for basic cheminformatics as we have as we can um, and we're really looking actually for somebody some support for this site now so we can build it into something a bit more substantive um, also have a kind of ebook which is not i, I won't quite call it a textbook but um, a kind of self-study guide for chem informatics um, which actually works as prerequisite for the graduate certificate as well um, kept the cost for that low is 25 dollars and it's um, also available um, in academic library versions that can be used at a whole institution or corporate versions as well. So again, the intent here is to kind of maximize the kind of broad um, options for learning about cheminformatics, and that's just at ebook.djwild.info. Uh, one thing I'm really excited about, and I think Bob is, um, is on the uh, webinar here, uh, Bob Belford at UALR, um, and I um, a co PIs, Bob's the main PI, on a NSF grant um, to actually create um, something called the Cheminformatics OLCC, which is actually something that's um, um, been around ACS for quite a while, the idea, but we're kind of really uh, bumping it up a bit. And the idea here is to um, enable undergraduate che um, chemistry students to learn basic cheminformatics and doing that by creating a bunch of online um, modules from, from many different places. And the kind of radical thing is that then uh, people locally at, at institutions teaching chemistry can form these into things called te teaching and learning objects, which can be used in courses locally. So this, it's not like a MOOC where it, everything's online, but lots of resources online, but it has that local element too. So it's kind of hybrid learning environment. We're just kind of getting going on this, but lots of exciting things happen. In, and there is a website, olcc.ccce.us, um, and uh, you can find out a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanted to talk today about uh, work that we've been doing for about uh, five or six years now on linking, um, linking different um, kinds of data uh, particularly large public data sets uh, for use in drug discovery and some of the things that we can do with that. In the constant context of cheminformatics, this is really contextualizing drugs and chemical compounds in you know billions of data. We always have to talk about billions and petascale and big data and everything, but really um, we're seeing how can we fit uh, compounds, not just into a very simple, you know, drug target model, but into the bigger picture of, of the data that we have out there. And that really kind of um, is the scope of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, the background is, um, you know, back when I did my PhD in the early 90s, I can remember being desperate to get a data set. Um, I wanted just a data set of you know, compounds and their activities against biological targets. And I, I can remember kind of pleading with, with uh, various people in industry to see if we could get some data release. A complete change nowadays in the last decade. We've seen a huge increase in the amount of public data, um, not just for, for chemistry data, but all kinds of different kinds of data related to drug discovery. Um, just some kind of statistics. Uh, there's now you know, 47, data on 47 million compounds and about 600,000 bioassays in PubChem. Um, about 1.8 million compounds tested in bioassays in PubChem bioassay. Uh, about 7,000 drugs in drug bank. 
33 million protein sequences, 90,000 3D structures in the PDB, uh, 93 million human nucleotide sequences. Uh, there's about 22 million life science publications and a million new each year. Um, so even just trying to keep track of, of literature is becoming impossible. And then all kinds of other sets, you know, toxicology sets, uh, chemogenomics, metagenomic sets coming out. Um, just, you know, just one example here at the bottom right, and this kind of goes across the board, really. This is just the number of entries in the um, Uniprot uh, data set, the protein sequence data set. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the year across the bottom. So we've got this kind of exponential increase, and you see this in all different kinds of uh, data forms. So we've got all this data splurged out there, but what, what can we do with it um, sensibly? Well, the, the, the kind of thing that struck me from the start is that, you know, this is great. We've got these data sets, but they're all in siloed. Um, and um, if we can find a way to break those silos, we can do something really interesting. Now, highly related to that is something that's been going on on the science side of drug discovery in the last few years, which is new paradigms for disease treatment. And we could talk a lot about the background of this, about us not finding new drugs and, um, and so on. But I think the bottom line is that we've realized that the simple kind of lock and key approach to drug discovery is too simplistic, where we you know, isolate a protein target of interest, find a compound which would you know, bind into that protein target, and um, you know, do a few PK tests, and lo and behold, we have a new drug. Um, what we're finding, particularly as we try and treat these complex diseases like uh, metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease and diabetes, that everything is much more complicated than that. And usually what happens is we, <clears throat> you know, either the drug isn't effective in, in the body or there are side effects, complicated side effects that we uh, don't want and so on. So th there's an understanding that we have to understand these complex networks of diseases and treatments and drugs and targets and side effects and so on in the body. And also new applications coming out of this, such as drug repurposing, finding new applications of established drugs or personalized medicines, trying to use you know, possibly multiple drugs in a kind of targeted fashion, which is tailored for individual patients. Um, so what we're finding, the intersection of these two things, all this data out there and about lots of different kinds of things and an understanding that we need to understand better how everything relates to everything else, we're starting to see these new computational fields emerging. And, the, you know, these definitions are not well um, kind of established yet. But you see terms like human genomics, concerned with relationship of targets and genes to compounds. Um, newer, um, this um, um, Alex Trocher and um, Trudy Welkria came up with this term systems chemical biology. I also see chemical systems biology used, which is really taking this a bit more broadly, looking at the relationships of many entities, you know, pathways, diseases, tissue samples, and so on, uh, to chemical compounds. Um, well, actually, on the website, we have, we're trying to dump some of the papers that uh, we think are interesting in area. Um, so uh, this is just kind of an example of, of, you know, one of the ways in which trying to you know, network together all the data and have this uh, more networked understanding of the body could be useful. Um, you know, almost every day something comes out on the BBC website um, about, you know, something along the lines of using or doing X. Um, means that something bad's going to happen or something bad good's going to happen. So, you know, eating bacon gives you cancer or drinking coffee reduces cancer risk and so on. So here's just one example which came out a while back. Use of ibuprofen um, reduces your risk of Parkinson's disease. So this was an observational study um, where, you know, pe people over time who regularly took ibuprofen seemed to have a lower risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Um, than those who didn't. Now, there are all kinds of problems with this kind of study, and you know, a lot of these kind of studies end up being wrong. But let's just assume for like, a, a moment that this is correct, that you know, taking ibuprofen will reduce your risk of Parkinson's disease. Well, how can we drill down from this? This is a clinical study, but how can we go about trying to understand the basis 
of, of why ibuprofen might be reducing the risk of Parkinson's disease. Well, you know, it's probably linked to neuroinflammation. We know ibuprofen reduces um, inflammation. Um, there's some studies about links of inflammation in Parkinson's, um, but other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories don't show this effect. Um, so, you know, we can start to come up with hypotheses about this, um, but, you know, there's no obvious way to try and put all the pieces together to look at these kind of questions. And, um, you know, what could be the mechanisms of action? What could be the evidence paths in the public data for this? So, you know, one thing I want to kind of take home today is that there's this new technology that's come along in the last few years called semantic technologies. Um, and um, this is really a plumbing stuff. We're not going to go deep into the kind of uh, workings of it, but it's really a plumbing technology, just like relational databases. But these technologies allow us to make all these links in the data. And then when we can apply the right algorithms and the right searching tools on that data, we can start to have a toolbox to answer those, these kind of questions and to probe, the, you know, come up with hypotheses and probe these kind of hypotheses. Um, so I'm going to be talking, you know, the work we've been doing in the last, at least the last three, four, five years has been based on semantic technologies. And now semantic technologies or semantic web, as it kind of used to be called, is one of those things that, you know, you know, certainly in the early days, I knew there was, it was something probably important, but I had no idea how to mentally plug in to what it really meant in any kind of practical sense. Um, so, and I think that's still the case now. You know, I have some vague idea that semantics are kind of useful, but we don't really know what it means. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to maybe just give you a plug-in point to what semantic technologies means. And it really goes back to this language, this you know, computing language called RDF, um, which is incredibly simple language. And really is just a, it's not rocket science, it's just a way of expressing subject, predicate, object relationships in a variety of different formats. So, you know, uh, ibuprofen inhibits COX-2 is a subject, predicate, object. The subject's ibuprofen, the object's COX-2, and the predicate is inhibits. It's really, really simple, but it just allows us to express those kind of relationships. Um, but the, the big uh, kind of shift in the last few years that made this stuff useful, uh, there are really three pieces to this. One was something called semantic triple stores. And these are really just, again, just like relational databases, just like a database management system, but for RDF triples. It's called a triple because it's three things, subject, predicate, object. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so this and semantic triple store is really just a big dump, allows you to have a huge dump of RDF triples of these um, relation, subject, predicate, object relationships, um, but gives a framework for searching it efficiently, being able to extract data from that and so on. Importantly, when you put lots of triples together, we'll look at this in a second, it becomes a network. So this, unlike a relational database, it becomes a network database. And the second is a language called Sparkle. If you're familiar with relational databases, the language is called SQL for searching relational databases. And Sparkle is kind of like a language de um, designed for querying triple stores. And the last is ontologies. Ontologies have, have been around for a long time, and another of those things that, like, you, you know, Boffin's arguing about what should be in ontologies. Um, but really, the change here is that ontologies have become practically useful just for things like describing classes of things. So, okay, here we've got a thing called a PubChem CID, and here we've got a thing called a drug bank DBID, and they're both examples of this thing called a chemical compound. So in some contexts, we can treat them as the same. But we've kind of learned how to just practically use ontologies rather than um, them being kind of highly theoretical things. So you're starting to see semantic technologies coming in out in all kinds of ways, in a big way, um, in, on the web in general. So Google um, now has uh, the Google Knowledge Graph, which, you know, if you type in Bloomington, Indiana to uh, Google, you get a piece on the right which is structured data about Bloomington, Indiana, not just text searching. Facebook has their Facebook uh, graph now where you can start to do intelligent searching. All of this is based on semantic technology, so they're starting to bubble through to the kind of everyday world. 
And so back to this RDF being the subject, predicate, object, I just want to give an example of how this can be really quite powerful. So let's say we just take drug bank, the drug data set. And you know, in drug bank, we um, can have this piece of information that ibuprofen has the target of PTGS2 or COX2 as it's uh, more often known. Well, more formally, um, in drug bank, we have this thing called a, a drug bank ID, which identifies each, each drug uh, uniquely, and that ibuprofen is DB01050. And PTGS2 also has a drug bank ID of 290, it's um, target number 290. So, in, uh, uh, you know, we can say it has a relationship, has target. So on the left here, we can cr create a piece of RDF that just says, DB01050 has target DBID290. And this is a valid format of RDF. RDF can be tab formatted, it can be XML, it can be all kinds of things. So this is a real piece of RDF, very simple. Ibuprofen has target COX2. And we could create lots of these for drug bank, and it would be just like a table in a relational database. But what about if we take something from another data set? Well, we could. So look at the um, comparative toxicogenomics data set and find there's also COX2 in there as well, or PTGS2. And in that data set, it has the ID CTV5743. Well, we can create a piece of RDF which says, well, the CTD5743 and the CTD is the same thing as this DBID290 in drug bank. And we can just represent that as an RDF triple. And we might find in that data set that uh, PDGS2 is related to Parkinson's disease um, from a paper, for instance. And here the Parkinson's disease is represented by a mesh term. Um, so again, we can now add a triple, this uh, COX2 has, has disease, uh, this mesh term. And then we can add another data set in as well. So we can, let's say we look at pumpkin bioacid and find, well, ibuprofen is in pumpkin bioacid too with this CID. So we can say this CID is the same as this drug bank ID. We could also say it's the same as other data sets. And we might know that this is as active in an assay AID1234. So we'll represent that as an RDF triple. And we might find that AID1234 is associated with Parkinson's disease. So you can see we can start to see network building up by taking all the data from the different data sets, representing them as RDF triples, and putting them together, we end up with this network. Now, this is a small network we're building bottom up. Um, but you know, what if we create a, a huge network by bringing all the data sets together? Well, if we do that, and that's kind of what we've done, this is, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is um, a real connection, set of network connections between ibuprofen and Parkinson's disease. Um, this is using a tool I'll show you briefly uh, later on. Um, and this is actually a selected set sub subgraph or selected network uh, based on literature support. If you want to look at the whole thing, it's kind of like this. <laughs> so lots of data, lots of things connected to lots of other things. And um, it's a you know big um, questions how we interpret these kinds of data sets, but this is the kind of thing we're doing. Um, so semantics is starting to have a big impact in drug discovery. Um, I think by far the biggest kind of most visible project in this is called Open Facts. You can just go to openfacts.org. This is a, a big EU funded project specifically to look at, at this problem. What can we do if we take all this data related to drug discovery uh, connect it semantically and then allow it to be um, searched and used um, in an integrated fashion. So open facts we've been involved with for several years and um, supported by the pharma industry as well as uh, the EU and various other organizations. Very exciting, we've just come out with the open facts API, so there's now an API you can use, uh, the tools, the open facts explorer. So, um, yeah, in fact, if you go to the website, just click on the community workshop link, you'll see some of the latest stuff going on there. Um, we're continuing to work with Open Fact. So, in terms of what we've been doing at IU, we've been kind of progressing through uh, what we call a stack, a semantic technology stack, which we presented in a Drug Discovery Today paper um, early last year. 
And the first step of that stack at the bottom, going from bottom to the top, is to create these accessible networks of semantically integrated data. And this is kind of what's now going mainstream with open facts and more generally with things like Google Knowledge Graph. Um, so our first question we asked was, can we, can, is it, can we do it in a sensible fashion? And we created something called chem to buy to rdf which um, uh, was our, our demonstration that could be done. And since then, we've been kind of moving our way up this stack and saying, okay, give, if, if we have that accessible network of data, what can we do with it? What kind of tools and algorithms, particularly graph theory tools and algorithms, can we apply to do interesting things with it? And then once we've got those, well, they might be fine, but do they have any impact on drug discovery? Can, is there any added value in all this stuff to drug discovery? And that's really where we're at at the moment. We're in this process at the moment of investigating what the added value and impact is of these methods. So we're kind of where the horizon is here. Um, so like I said, the first thing we did was called chem to buy to rdf And um, you can go to chem to buy to rdf.org or click on the link on, on my website. Um, I should say a lot of work I've been doing, it's been really nice collaboration here with um, a semantic web group at IU, which is a very well-established semantic web group led by Ying Ding. And almost everything we've done here has been in collaboration with that group. Um, so came to buy to RDF, uh, integrates 42 public data sets uh, uh, using RDF and uh, semantic triple stores um, and creates a Sparkle endpoint that lets us search Basically, let's just search that data. Um, some of the data sets, PubChem, Kemble, Drug Bank, PharmGKB, uh, CTD, uh, CIDA, side effects data set, um, covering all kinds of different disciplines, chemistry, toxicology, and so on. Um, and uh, that's described in the BMC Bioinformatics paper from 2010. Um, well, what we found with this is that using this language, so there's this language called Sparkle, which, you know, if you're not a computer scientist, you'll probably look at this thing on the left and, like, it'll turn you right off. But, you know, for, a com for you know, somebody who's computer-oriented, um, it's not that difficult to learn this language called Sparkle. It's very much like SQL for relational databases, ex except that it's really about describing paths through data more than relational queries. But what we find, found was that by using Sparkle together with an ontology that we created called chem to buy to owl we could answer simple questions that were very difficult to answer before. Um, so, for example, here's a question. Is a drug troglitazone, what pathways, is, would you know, biological pathways, metabolic pathways in the body, will troglitazone affect? Well, how do we answer this question? There isn't really a drug pathway database we can use. Um, and there's lots of drug target databases, lots of target path, several target pathway databases. But you know, we couldn't answer this question in one fell swoop. Um, but with Sparkle, with Chem to Buy to RDF, we can just ask it with this sing single Sparkle query on the left. And if you're interested in this stuff, you can actually go to the link on our website and paste in these sparkles and try them out. So what we're really saying here is, well, find me all the drugs um, that, that are associated with genes such that those genes, um, sorry, find, uh, find me all the instances of the drug troglitazone. Um, and this could be in many different data sets, um, such that that drug troglitazone is associated with a particular with um, a particular gene, such that that gene is in um, a particular pathway. So we're finding all the pathways that um, have genes associated with them that have troglitazone associated with them. So it's like a little path. More complex one is you know what are possible multi-target inhibitors of the MAPK pathway? And here we can say things like well find me all the PubChem compounds such that there's a bioassay result, um, and in that bioassay description, it's linked to a gene in the Uniprot data set, and that gene in the Uniprot data set in the Reactor or Keg data set is mapped to the particular MAPK pathway. So these really simple questions that a scientist might ask, which were used to be really complicated to answer because they required lots of siloed data sets, can now actually be answered quite simply. But you know, we, we kind of I know from working in industry that we're probably not going to get medicinal chemists to learn Sparkle. 
nor should they learn Sparkle. We've got much more important things to be doing. So um, we said, okay, what can we layer on top of these networks that can actually be either end user tools or at least useful tools um, for, for mining and extracting information from these networks. And there's really been very little work done uh, in this area, in, the seman in semantics as a whole, uh, not just in drug discovery. Um, so I think what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to take a risk here and shell out to a browser and actually show you a couple of these things rather than uh, just show you PowerPoint slides. So if you go to djwild.info, this is risky, of course, everything will go down when I'm trying to use it, but um, and then you can just click on the Chem, Chem Biospace Association search here. And what this little tool does is, it's, it's again, it's not rocket science. It's really doing a, um, a classic uh, graph search uh, between any two items in the network. So, for example, we can say, OK, I want to find this, this network that exists, of paths that exist between a drug and a side effect. So I'm going to take a drug, um, which um, is going to be rosy glitazone, which is a diabetes drug, as a start node, and a side effect as an end node, uh, which is myocardial infarction or heart attack. Um, and this is actually a, a known side effect of rosy glitazone. I've got so up to 40 paths and search. And this is now going to go away and do a, a, um, a search between um, you know, every instance of the drug rosiglitazone and every instance of the side effect myocardial infarction and find out what connects them. So it's now building a sub-network of connections uh, between uh, rosiglitazone and myocardial infarction. What we actually did, we actually drilled down into this particular problem um, and we're able to very quickly come up with um, a, a several uh, plausible mechanisms of action for this side effect, um, you know, one of which seems to be um, actually validated by some recent literature. Um, so what's happening here is you can see that in this, it's probably not visible here, and I'm not sure I can really be, make it bigger on my screen, but these smaller gray boxes um, list the actual data sets that make the connections, then these bigger boxes are the actual data points themselves. So this is all going to connect up in a second. And here we find that, okay, well, here we've got a cluster of targets um, up here found, over, and these are found from the farm GKB set. And these express a relationship between troglitazone and those targets, uh, sorry, rosiglitazone and those targets by this data set. And the data set also um, has an, a bunch of other drugs which are related to those targets. But those other, other drugs in a different data set, the side, the side effects data set, are associated with myocardial infarction. So what this is really telling us is there's a bunch of other drugs which have a known side effect of myocardial infarction, which share certain tar targets with rosiglitazone. Here they are. And we're able to actually, with a variety of tools, drill this down to apolipoprotein E which does raise LDL cholesterol levels. So this was our first attempt at the tool uh, for finding, looking at these kind of relationships. Um, but you know, the problem with this kind of data is that the more data you have, the more everything becomes connected to everything else, and the less meaning there is for a particular relationship. Um, so what we then did was we, we decided to look at, you know, can we look at probability and statistics to find the most, um, sorry, find the most significant relationships uh, between uh, things in the data set. And that led us to what we call semantic link association prediction, or SLAP. And what SLAP really does is say, it's for drugs, for trying to predict drug target associations. It's actually based originally on an algorithm which was for social networking, the kind of algorithm that in Facebook says, you know, because you're friends with these people, you might also be friends with these other people. This one says, and you know, we've done lots of heuristics since then. This is really saying, well, let's take a you know, troglitazone and PPAR gamma target, where there really is a relationship between those, but let's pretend it's not there. Um, could we derive it by looking at all the other data? So we have these things called path patterns between drugs and targets. So one might be that 
the drug binds to a different target, but there are other drugs which bind to both targets. Or there is an ontological class which contains this drug or this compound and another uh, compound, and uh, this other compound is related to the target. Or maybe it activates uh, or um, is, uh, binds to a target which is part of a pathway which this other target is part of. So what we do is we, um, we take all these path patterns, look at the, the natural distributions of those path patterns in the data set as a whole, then look for instances where we have statistically significant path patterns for a particular drug target combination. So this means we can come up with something called an association score, which is strength of association between the drug and target, but also a p-value, a statistical p-value as to whether or not that association is significant. Um, so I'm actually good, I'll use the slides on this just for the sake of time. Um, but what we can then do is, for instance, we can type in a drug. Here this is the drug or compound is troglitazone, and the target's PXR in this case, NR1I2. It will find us all the statistically significant path patterns between the drug and the target, and we can visualize them here. But um, it will have a p-value for this. So in this case, the, the um, association is, is, yeah, is, you know, is, is weak association. Um, it's, um, but there is a, a statistical association there. So we would predict a missing link between these two um, things. Um, so where we can also use it is in a kind of virtual screening sense, um, where we can say, okay, well, we can take, we can calculate this association between the compound and all human targets in drug bank, for instance. And then we do that for lots of compounds and use that, those vectors of associations as a measure of similarity between the drugs. Now this similarity, because SLAP includes chemical structure similarity as well as biological, it's kind of like a hybrid biological chemical similarity. We find that this is incredibly uh, um, interesting in terms of the um, bringing back um, correct associations between uh, drugs which aren't brought out by other methods. One example here is if you do a search for troglitazone. So if you use the tool, you can actually just type in in, in the interface, just try and pin a drug name and not a target name, and it'll do this kind of virtual screen of targets. Um, and at the bottom, it'll show related drugs to the one that you've typed in. If you do this for troglitazone, the diabetes drug, it'll come out with um, you know, pinglitazone, which is in the same series, but also then a bunch of cardiovascular drugs. Now, troglitazone isn't a cardiovascular drug, it's a diabetes drug. And certainly, you know, rosiglitazone, which is very similar, is the opposite of a cardiovascular drug. It raises LDL levels. But actually, troglitazone is an LDL-lowering drug. It could have been a, another statin. It just was never marketed for that because, uh, because Lipitor or Tolvastatin uh, worked better. So we're finding in many different ways that SLAP is pulling out these really interesting relationships that are not found with, with kind of more, quote, siloed methods. Uh, so we're using this to look for um, potential candidates for drug repurposing. The kinds of things we can do here is, because we can calculate the similarity between drugs based on these profiles across targets, we can use that to create a new network of drugs, where there's an edge between two drugs if they, sh if they have a certain level of correlation between those, those target vectors. And then we can do things like this, where we... Um, we color the, the nodes here, or the drugs, by their known indication. And then we look for drugs which have very similar target profiles, but which have different indications as potential drug repurposing candidates. And again, we're finding that um, you know, some of this is backed up by recent literature. And um, also doing things like this, where we just take a bunch of targets and a bunch of uh, drugs and calculate strap, slap um, association between them, and then we can create, this is a bipartite network of drugs and targets. And we can use that, to, this is actually using another collaborator's work at IU, Katy Werner, who works on network visualization. And we can create network, you know, really drug repurposing networks where we um, can, uh, these are suggested um, um, repurposing of drugs. Uh, that is currently not known for particular targets, but we, we predict uh, there's a strong 
likelihood it would be associated with them. And we're now actually working through these with some wet lab people and so on to, to see how many of these pan out. Um, so we, we're now building other huge networks. These are large scale repurposing networks. And a lot of our effort right now is going into um, how best to do that. Um, so the, you know, the next stage in this, you've got all these algorithms, but as you know, this as the last few slides are showing, we really have to think about whether it's making a difference. Is it going to add value to the drug discovery process? And um, we're working in a variety of ways um, on that right now, both through the academic uh, collaborations that we have uh, with several groups. Uh, we also now have a spin-off company from IU called Data Discovery, the purpose being to actually take this into the commercial world. So through Data Discovery, we're actually working with several pharma companies now to apply these in real-life drug discovery environments to understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, what we know so far is that you know everybody's coming to a kind of joint understanding that being able to access fully integrated public data is hugely important, particularly data curated from recent publications such as that in Kemble. Um, and co well, currently the options to that are, are limited. Um, but you know, particularly open facts is opening up to a much more widely the possibility of doing this. And um, a huge kind of um, opportunity for companies, pharma companies, is to integrate their own internal data with the public data um, and um, be able to do uh, predictions and uh, mining that go across um, public and private data. Uh, this is something that's been looked at in open facts and also we're working on as well. Uh, even being able to look at, you know, it's almost like diversity analysis back in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> you know, being able to say what's the most valuable pieces of data that we have relative to the public data. And we're finding that uh, the SLAP approach is very kind of basic, you know, this is very version one, but we're finding that we're able to eke out really interesting relationships that are not just background noise, but which are real, that are not found by other methods, such as uh, you know, traditional predictive modeling methods. Um, you know, and that, this leads to something that we're doing, um, investigating here, I have a PhD student working on this right now, um, which is called integrative virtual screening, which is really saying, well, let's take all our traditional methods in chemical informatics and drug discovery, like random forests and pharmacophore searches and so on, and, and bring them together with these new approaches, which are coming at new network approaches, which kind of ha have a completely different perspective and much wider scope, and say, can we get, take the best of all of them? So we're looking at data fusion as a way to bring those together, and early indications are that doing things like virtual screening by data fusing, um, you know, for example, SLAP with uh, other predictive modeling methods is, is um, showing a lot of promise. So we actually have compounds going into, into testing in a couple of projects right now, and we're just waiting for those results to come back, but we, we're kind of hopeful that we've got some really interesting compounds there. Um, also looking at using these tools together for uh, looking at mechanisms of action, which is kind of where we started off with that ibuprofen example. Uh, we've done some work, for example, with um, thiazoline diones and their uh, interesting range of side effects. Uh, just briefly, a few very uh, current things going on. Very exciting work coming out of the Netherlands and the Open Facts people on nano publications. And this is taking the RDF idea a step further. And um, a nano publication is really kind of a piece of RDF, so a particular data point, but which is encapsulated by uh, provenance information in particular which um, tells you where it came from. So in this way, we can completely free data from data sets. So um, we can have completely free, like a packet on a network, we can have completely freestanding data points represented as nano publications. <clears throat> and we can always get back to the source of where they came from. So we're looking at with a, a ways of, for instance, being able to produce nano publications as part of the scholarly publication process. Um, also, you know, I alluded earlier on to this problem that there's, you know, we can often observational studies and there's um, um, studies involving complex um, 
biology can end up just being proved wrong. There's this guy called John Ioannidis at Stanford. Um, this was actually an um, Atlantic Monthly article. Uh, but he's written s s papers basically shockingly saying that about 60% of all medical research, even in the top journals, is later proved to be wrong. And this gets to kind of experimental bias, uh, gets to problems with observational studies, all kinds of reasons for this. But a huge amount of wrong data out there, not just at the experimental level, but in terms of the conclusion level. Um, so um, there's also a guy called Ben Goldick who gave a TED talk a while ago. He's been a book and so on. A kind of effervescent British physician who's basically showed that because there's a lot of selectivity in what results get out into the public, particularly from pharma, uh, where you know positive studies are much more likely to be published than negative ones, we have a lot of bias in the data, which can really lead us down the wrong path. So again, very interested in you know well you know. One criticism of these kind of big data approaches, are you just going to get errors propagating throughout the data and if you'll end up with just one big uh, misleading uh, uh, data source? Um, but instead, I'm interested in saying, well, can we look for independent confirmatory sources or confirmatory paths in the data? So that we can say, well, you know, there might be a 60% chance this one study is wrong, but we have this very different kind of study also telling us the same kind of thing. Um, so being able to use the big data um, positively in a quality sense. Um, finally, um, very exciting uh, kind of new area of research is looking at uh, mining electronic medical records. We just had a um, workshop at IU basically looking at you know, what, what might happen if we take all of our semantic data in drug discovery about or molecular data and put it together with all the data that's um, coming out in electronic medical records. Um, and, you know, incredible possibilities there, including even, you know, applications for doctors to help them repurpose drugs on the fly based on clinical data and, um, and, and molecular data. So you can actually go to that uh, website. That's linked from my website too. And all our materials we produced are on that, so online there as well. So this is very, very new, but uh, I think very exciting as well. So in summary, you know, there's a huge amount of data now out there in the public domain, but it's, it's still siloed by discipline or experimental time. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, we're finding you know, the lock and key model, which fits that siloed data set approach, is being found to be too simplistic. And we do have to understand how everything's connected to everything else. Um, yeah, I think what we've been able to show at IU and us in open fact is that semantic technologies are kind of a plumbing technology which is capable of making those connections between the siloed data sets. And that with this kind of technology stack, we can start to apply algorithms which can do some really interesting things with the data uh, once it's integrated. Um, and there's all kinds of potential new application areas in uh, you know, drug discovery, drug repurposing, mechanism of action, um, <clears throat> and uh, overcoming data problems, linking with medical records. We're certainly not going to do all that stuff. I'd love to do it all, but um, it's not going to be us that do, do it, does it? But I think these are kind of growing understanding that all kinds of data opportunities that if we do them right, could be really valuable, both in drug discovery and in healthcare and medicine as a whole. Well, I've, I've done what I said I, I tend to do as a professor and open my mouth and it keeps on coming out. So I'll, uh, I think I'll stop there and then uh, maybe hand back to David and see if there are any questions. Dave, did you want to take it there, or do you want to just go straight over to questions? Okay, there was, well, there's a question from Girinath, how to get involved in these projects. Um, 
you know, and learn more about the semantic approaches. Um, you know, probably a first stop would be um, my website and the Open Facts website. Um, there's certainly lots of resources out there, some really great resources actually, MOOCs and something called Semantic University for learning generic um, technology, semantic technologies. Um, so there's, there's definitely some good resources out there for doing that. Specifically for drug discovery, I think, um, the, you know, Open Facts and my website. There's also a bunch of generic tools out there which have been used in pharma specifically for semantic searching on triple stores like top grade IO, IO informatics. I'll just type that into the thing here, IO informatics. Um, um, top, top quadrant, another one. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple, uh, there's, there's certainly more than that. Um, that you know, from a commercial pers perspective are interesting to look into. Okay, I, I think I'm back now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Dave. Okay, I have a question. Um, you mentioned uh, in uh, part of the talk that there was one uh, particular uh, compound that would have been uh, tested as a statin, but that Lipitor was much better. And I, I wondered, um, in the RDF triple world, if all uh, triples, all relationships are created equal, or if there would be a way to express that uh, one particular substance was better uh, at a relationship or the strength of the relationship was stronger uh, than others? Great, great question. Well, well there's two pieces. Uh, uh, one, uh, so one, one piece is that it's really easy semant with semantics to, for instance, weight things by, um, by their source. So you can say, you know, you can say I'm. I want to weight what's in the in chem spider three times um, more strongly than what's in pub chem, or vice versa. Um, so that's easy to do. And also using ontologies, being able to weight by types is easy. What's not good in semantics, and this is a problem that people are trying to address now, is um, it's really developed, been developed for categorical relationships rather than quantitative relationships. So it's really easy to express that a compound binds to a particular target, or even a compound has some, some you know, binding class. So we maybe have five different categories of strength of binding. What's not easy is being able to express something like, you know, the IC50 for this binding relationship is whatever. So this is a problem right now, this kind of weighting of edges is a problem with semantics that the, the, the next level of, uh, of semantic technologies I think are going to address. And the way we handle it right now is to use those, those broad classifications of binding. And um, I think it kind of works because we're not trying to use this in a, um, you know, in a highly accurate binding prediction mode, like a docking algorithm or something. We're using it in, in, in a kind of uh, ideas generation mode where, look, you know, this, there's a relationship between these things, it might be worth looking at. So we always present what we do with the caveat that, you know, it's not meant to replace these highly accurate binding prediction methods, which are, usually have very limited scope. This is a very wide scope, you know, here's a bunch of ways in which these things are related, so they might be worth looking at. Uh, you know, much like on Facebook, you know, Facebook doesn't try to say, well, you know, you spend you know, you spent 20 minutes talking with this person yesterday and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just says, you know, there's things which connect to you, so maybe you want to be friends with this person. Okay, thank you. Perhaps time for one last question. If someone could want to type it into the chat box. If not, well, uh, thanks again, David, for a, a very, oh, someone is typing. We'll wait a, a second or two. How okay, often? Great. Yeah, how often does the data get updated? Um, for chem to buy to RDF, it hasn't been updated since 2010 because this was a proof of concept uh, project. We are trying to put some work into updating it now. 
this is actually something we want to do with industry partners. So, um, you know, it's part of the, we can't get an NSF grant to keep it updated, but uh, through data to discovery, we can work with industry, not just to update it, but to add other data sets in. Um, but we are, we are, for example, we are updating to Kenmore 15 or possibly 16 right now. Um, so, but with open facts is being kept. In fact, what we're actually doing is writing scripts so that we can keep it continually updated. So we're, I'm hopeful the Kem to buy idea soon will be updated regularly. Open facts is updated regularly. So the data in open facts um, should, be, should be pretty well up to date. Okay, well, thank you again, David, for a very interesting and informative presentation. Thanks to all who attended. Uh, reminder on the next uh, webinar, uh, June 27th, Martin Walker on using Wikipedia as a source of chemical information. So have a good 